Good evening. I'm glad that you're enjoying each other's company already. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started for the evening. I'm Cynthia Jackson Elmore, the Dean of the Honors College and a professor of political science here at Michigan State University. And I'm very excited that you're joining us for our first Sharper Focus Wider Lens of the 2014-2015 year. You can't hear it? Okay. I'm trying to move it closer, see if that helps any. Is that helping? Not a whole lot. Yeah, they're checking on it for us now. Test one, two, test one, two, better, okay. And I'm gonna move the mic just a little bit, so make sure you can still hear me, test one, two. All right, thank you very much. Do I need to start over? I don't wanna leave anyone <laughs> out, okay. So I was saying that I am Cynthia Jackson Elmore, the Dean of the Honors College, and I'm a professor of political science here at the university. And I'm very excited that you're joining us for our first Sharper Focus Wider Lens of the 2014-2015 academic year. Um, this is our third and a half year of the series, and we're pretty excited about it. So on tonight, we are gonna be talking about the evolving nature of rights. It's part of this Project 6050 here on campus. And I have a public service announcement. If you have not yet silenced or turned off your cell phones, I'm going to ask you to do so in respect to the panelists. And then I also wanna take a moment to recognize our sponsors and some other members that are here before I introduce our panel and turn it over to them so that you have a sense of tonight. Each of our panelists will present for about 10 minutes on their take on the evolving nature of rights. And you're gonna find that they are crossing different areas and that's quite all right. Then after they all speak, we'll have a bit of cross talk here on the panel and then we will open the floor to you. It's really important that there's an opportunity to have dialogue between the audience and the panelists so we will ensure that we leave enough time for that. And then we also leave enough time if you wanna come up and chat with anyone individually. Our sponsors for tonight's program include a variety of colleges, including the College of Agricultural and Natural Resources, the College of Law, the College of Social Science, the College of Osteopathic Medicine, James Madison College, Lyman Briggs College, the Residential College of Arts and Humanities, the Department of Anthropology, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, and the Department of Political Science. Also have some partners in crime here tonight, hanging out in the back is Professor John Beck, who coordinates this series on behalf of the Honors College. He goes and finds all the wonderful talent on campus and puts together all of the topics. He also comes up with zingers from the audience, so every now and then he'll throw out a question and he'll help field the questions or get around to you with microphones later. Also have Stephanie Cpac here, who is our communications manager, for the Honors College, she helps with all the publicity and recording, and I know that there is at least one other member of the Honors College staff here on tonight, one of our advisors, Sadiq Mohammed, and so we're very pleased to have them here on tonight. And of course, our stars for tonight, and why we're really excited about this, is a lot of times we bring speakers to campus and they leave. And so the community, students, fellow researchers don't get an opportunity to continue the dialogue. We started this series so that we can celebrate our own homegrown stars and show the work that faculty are doing and give an opportunity for students in the community and faculty to stay connected with these individuals. So on tonight, I am pleased to introduce to you and I'm gonna introduce them all first and then they'll go with their presentations. We're gonna start with Dr. Stephen Kautz. He is Associate Dean for Academic and Student Affairs in the College of Social Science. He's also an Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science. He joined the faculty in 2000 after teaching at Emory University for 10 years. His research interest is in the fields of modern political philosophy and American political thought. He is the author of Liberalism and Community, a Defense of the Classical Liberalism of Locke and Montesquieu, Locke and Montesquieu, against his contemporary critics. He is currently working on a book on the political thought of Abraham Lincoln, focusing on challenges of democratic statesmanship, democratic statesmanship. His essay on Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, the Moderation of a Democratic Statesman, appears in History of American Political Thought. He teaches both undergraduate and PhD courses on modern political philosophy, American political thought, liberalism, 
constitutionalism, comparative constitutionalism, and British politics. And he earned his doctorate from the University of Chicago. To his immediate left is Joan Haworth, Dean of the Michigan State University College of Law, and she assumed that position in 2008. Prior to her deanship, she was a professor at the William S. Boyd School of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. There she was named the William S. Board Professor of Law in 2003 and was instrumental in building the Boyd School of Law. She served for four years as Associate Dean and helped to establish Boyd's early and strong national reputation. Dean Haworth began her career as a law professor in 1989 after stints with California's Office of the State Public Defender and the ACLU Foundation of Southern California. She has been a faculty member at Golden Gate University School of Law and a visiting professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, the UC Hastings College of Law, and UC Davis School of Law. Most recently, she has taught courses on constitutional law and on gender and a capital defense clinic as well she has run. The scholarship for which she is most known focuses on gender and the death penalty. Dean Haworth earned her Juris Doctorate, Order of the Coif, from the University of Southern California. And I'm trying to remember if I knew that we were fellow alums together. So, to my immediate right, we have Dr. Laurie Medina. She is an Associate Professor and Associate Chair of the Department of Anthropology in the College of Social Science. Her research integrates issues in economic development, environmentalism, and indigenous rights. Her research on agricultural development in Belize links the construction and mobilization of collective identities to negotiations over development priorities and agendas. Her work on ecotourism in Belize focuses on efforts to combine economic development with conservation goals as these intersect with the struggles over indigenous rights to land. With funding from the MacArthur Foundation, her current research project explores the complex negotiations involved in implementing ecotourism in several Mopan, did I say that right? Mopan? Mopan. Mopan Maya villages in the tropical forests of southern Belize. Her courses include a graduate seminar as well as an undergraduate course on culture, resources, and power, along with courses on Latin America, environment and development, and social and cultural theory. She earned her doctorate from UCLA. To my immediate left, we have Dr. Joan Rose. She is the Homer Nolan Endowed Chair in Water Research in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. She's also the Director of Water Quality, Environmental and Molecular Biology Lab, Co-Director of the Center for Advancing Microbial Risk Assessment, and the Co-Director of the Center for Water Resources. Prior to joining MSU, she served as professor at the University of Southern Florida. She's an international expert on water microbiology, water quality, public health safety, and has published more than 250 manuscripts. She is specifically interested in microbial pathogen transport in coastal systems and risks to recreational waters and the study of climate factors which impact water quality. Dr. Rose serves on the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Great Lakes Authority Board, and she earned her doctorate from the University of Arizona. And to my far left, we have Dr. William Strample. He is Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine and a professor of internal medicine. He previously served as the college's interim dean and the college's senior associate dean, and he also led the medical direct, and he is also the lead, is that better, the lead medical director of the MSU health team. Bear with me, me and my glasses aren't cooperating today. Before coming to MSU, Strample was a special assistant to the U.S. Surgeon General for Operations and Readiness. He also served as the chief medical officer for the TRICARE management activity and as director of quality management in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Strample was commander of the Brook Army Medical Center and the Great Plains Regional Medical Command and was the chief 
of the Quality Assurance Division in the Office of the Surgeon General, Department of the Army. He also served in a number of capacities at hospitals in Colorado, Kansas, and Korea. He earned his Doctor of Osteopathy from the Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine. So before we even begin, how about a round of applause for recognizing who we have in the room? And so we're going to go ahead and start with Dr. Kautz, Steve. Thank you. Let me begin by thanking the Honors College and Dean Jackson Elmore for sponsoring this event and for the invitation to participate. I also want to take this opportunity to express my appreciation to Professor John Beck, who has long been an excellent citizen of Michigan State University, not least in his efforts to organize such programs as this one. Few faculty members so fully appreciate the public spirited and democratic aspiration of the land-grant university. We're lucky to have him here. My task is to say something about the historical meaning of the distinctively modern idea of rights. Others will speak of contemporary challenges. I aim to offer historical perspective through a discussion of a troubling but illuminating aspect of the political thought of Abraham Lincoln. Tonight's event is part of a program at MSU called Project 6050, a year-long community conversation on civil and human rights. One way of approaching my topic tonight is to focus on that distinction between civil and human rights, or as I would prefer to say, between civil and natural rights. All men are created equal. What is the meaning of that unlikely proposition? Our ancient faith as Americans has long been an easy target of derision. Senator John Pettit of Indiana won for himself an unhappy immortality. As long as free men and women recall the name Abraham Lincoln, they will hear too of John Pettit by declaring that proposition a self-evident lie. As one scholar puts it, few propositions outside the Bible have offered so easy a mark to the shafts of unintelligently clever criticism. Most famously, in March 1861, the newly elected vice president of the so-called Confederate States of America, Alexander Stevens, argued in a widely disseminated and authoritative speech that the cornerstone of the new government, quote, rests upon the great truth that the Negro, I am quoting Stevens, is not equal to the white man. This was the quarrel that made a civil war, a terrible civil war. Was the claim of the declaration that all men are created equal true? And what did it mean? It would not be too much to say, though a further argument would be needed to vindicate this claim, that we fought a civil war over the idea of natural rights. On his trip to Washington to assume the office of president, Lincoln said, I have never had a thought politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln's statesmanship is marked by single-minded devotion to the restoration of the authority of the Declaration and its fundamental principle, to which he appealed over and over and over again as a rebuke and stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. Let us readopt the Declaration of Independence, Lincoln says at Peoria in 1854. But what is the meaning of the proposition all men are created equal? Here is Lincoln from the Dred Scott speech in 1857. They, the founders, did not mean to say all were equal in color, size, intellect, moral developments, or social capacity. They defined with tolerable distinction what respects they did consider all men created equal. Equal in, quote, certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This they said, and this they meant. In the famous debates with Stephen Douglas, he would put this last point with particular force. I agree with Judge Douglas, he is not my equal in many respects, certainly not in color, perhaps not in moral and intellectual endowment, but in the right to eat the bread without leave of anybody else, which his own hand earns. He is my equal, and the equal of Judge Douglas, and the equal of every living man. It is in one sense an obvious untruth to say that all men are created equal. We are manifestly not equal in all or almost all of the various faculties that human beings possess. For example, in color, size, intellect, moral developments, or social capacity. But if human beings are not equal in the possession of any particular faculty or set of faculties, on what grounds do Jefferson and Lincoln affirm that we are nevertheless equal in certain inalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I do not propose to settle that question today, but I do wish to make two observations about the relevance of that very difficult philosophical question about the meaning of the idea of equality to the inquiry into the evolving nature of rights that is our business today. First, 
Our belief as a people that all men are created equal has become second nature to us, no doubt partly through Lincoln's dedication of the nation to that principle at Gettysburg. No Alexander Stevens could tempt us to abandon our ancient faith today. But it is also true that our almost habitual egalitarianism is now a deep source of complacency about the meaning of equality or of natural or human rights. Who among us can specify in a convincing way what it means to say that all men are created equal? We are often tempted to say with the distinguished historian Carl Becker, in the Declaration, the foundation of the United States is indissolubly associated with a theory of politics, a philosophy of human rights which is valid, if at all, not for Americans only, but for all men. But what seems but common sense in one age often seems but nonsense in another. Such, for the most part, is the fate which has overtaken the sublime truths enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. But is that quite good enough? How do we respond to an Alexander Stevens or to a Stalin or Hitler, among other villains, if we can do no better than to say it is valid, if at all, for Americans only. If rights are always evo evolving, to borrow from the title of our panel today, if there are no natural rights beyond all contingency, then must we admit that our own most fundamental rights are up for grabs, contingent all the way down, so to speak, that our rights depend upon who we are. A second observation, more troubling. The perplexity about the meaning of the proposition that all men are created equal that is presently at issue is somehow at the root of an important and deeply disquieting dimension of Lincoln's understanding of equality. As is well known, just as Lincoln firmly denounced slavery, if slavery is not wrong, he said nothing is wrong, he also quite clearly argued that the principles of the Declaration of Independence, including the principle that all men are created equal, do not of themselves require or even justify social and political equality. And he made it clear that in arguing against slavery, he was not arguing for social and political equality of the races. The theory, theoretical puzzle is a simple one. If there are such things as natural rights, and by the way, wishing won't make it so, they do not extend very far, though they may reach very deep. Return again to Lincoln's gloss on the meaning of the Declaration. They did not mean to say all were equal in color, size, intellect, moral developments, or social capacity. They defined with tolerable distinctness in what respects they did consider all men created equal, equal in certain inalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This they said, and this they meant. Consider the following fragment in Lincoln's hand on, on slavery, evidently a private note. If A can prove, however conclusively, that he may have right enslaved B, why may not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may, may enslave A? You say A is white and B is black. It is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. You do not mean color exactly. You mean the whites are intellectually the superior of blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them. Take care again. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. This brief statement constitutes the core, it seems to me, of a satisfactory refutation of any argument in defense of slavery on grounds of natural inequality. What Lincoln has done is to shrewdly turn the observation that no faculty of human beings is possessed equally against the partisans of slavery. If those inequalities matter, who might not be justly enslaved? Take care. But this argument against slavery does not justify social and political equality for any human being or for any class of human beings. Of course, inequality in the possession and even in the cultivation of many of the faculties of human beings is a relevant consideration in any inquiry regarding social and political equality, even though such inequality is not relevant to the question of the justice of slavery. That is, the case against slavery and the case for social and political equality must rest on separate moral foundations. The idea of natural rights or natural equality can only provide the barest beginnings of the more general case for equality that today we want to make, hence the evolving nature of rights. Emancipation was the more urgent task, the vindication of the natural rights of the slaves and the fulfillment of a duty arising from our common humanity. Slavery was a monstrous injustice. The achievement of social and political equality was and is the nobler task, but the call of justice is here quieter, more contingent, and the ground of our duties is not our common humanity, but our shared citizenship as men and women making a life together. That is, those rights of shared citizenship might well be said to evolve, even if natural rights do not. They are the product of deliberation and agreement, not capable of being discovered in nature. 
There is indeed some evidence, for example, that the war transformed Lincoln into a qualified and tentative partisan of social and political equality of the races, as earned justice for the freedmen, some of whom had contributed mightily to the cause of freedom. There will, he said, be some black men who can remember that with silent tongue and clenched teeth and steady eye and well-poised bayonet, they have helped mankind on to this great consummation. While I fear there will be some white ones, unable to forget that with malignant heart and deceitful speech, they have strove to hinder it. For Lincoln, the question of social and political equality could not be settled on the abstract and universal ground of natural rights, the ground upon which the slavery question must be settled. Both parts of this conviction are important, both that the case against slavery must be grounded on natural rights and that the case for social and political equality cannot be. The question of social and political equality had to be settled on the ground of the capacity of the former slaves and the freedmen to live together as fellow citizens. And that is a question of many dimensions. We are still struggling with the legacy of the failed efforts of many generations to settle it. Thank you, Dr. Kautz. Thank you. It's really a ple pleasure for me to be here tonight and, uh, and an honor. And since the very beginning of getting this invitation to come and talk with you all about the evolving nature of rights, I've wanted to talk about something I think about a lot, which is winners and losers in the United States Supreme Court. And my goal tonight in the next eight minutes is to convince you that in the last 30 years or so, it's a history not as far back as we've just heard, but in the last 30 years, gays and lesbians have made astonishing advances, just wonderful advances in the United States Supreme Court at the very same time that the court has turned its back on racial equality. And the way I'm going to do this is to think about two infamous, terrible, some of the worst decisions of the 20th century that were both decided in the 80s when I was an ACLU attorney. Both 5-4 decisions, both, in other words, very close, and both of them, Justice Lewis Powell was the swing vote. And that would be Bowers versus Hardwick in 86 and McCleskey versus Kemp. Bowers versus Hardwick, and this is going to shock some of you, so be shocked. In Bowers versus Hardwick, the court, the United States Supreme Court, said that there is nothing in our Constitution, nothing in the way of equality or privacy or liberty that protects gays and lesbians from having states decide to have consensual adult gay sex be classified as a felony. Okay? We're not talking non-discrimination. We're not talking about same-sex marriage. We're talking about me and my girlfriend being able to be sent to prison for having gay sex. That was a law in many states in the 80s. The, the ACLU took that to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said it was obvious that there was no good claim here. There's no, it was obvious that there was no constitutional right to protect gays and lesbians. In fact, they said, at best, such claims are facetious. We were laughed out of court in 1986 on that very fundamental question of whether or not we could be criminalized for our sexual behavior. And that, the court's opinion wasn't even the worst. The worst was the Chief Justice of the United States, Just, Chief Justice Berger, in his, wrote separately in order to completely condemn gay sex. He wrote that condemnation of these practices is firmly rooted in Judeo-Christian standards. He wrote it was a capital offense under Roman law. He wrote the Blackstone from the 1700s said that sodomy between gay people is a crime worse than rape. Okay, can you imagine hearing this? It was a shock. It was like a gut punch, right, in the middle of the 80s. And this is not just some fools on the corner. This is the United States Supreme Court telling us what gays and lesbians can think about their rights in, at the, in the United States Constitution. Okay, so that's 1986, 5-4, swing vote with Justice Powell. The, year, the next year, the court decided McCleskey versus Kemp. Incredibly significant death penalty case and racial justice case. In that case, again, 5-4, the majority of the court by one vote, which you can't win a ping pong game by one vote, but here we are, by one vote, the court said that statistical evidence of racial bias and who gets the death penalty was not enough by itself 
to violate the Equal Protection Clause. So you had a, a person like Warren McCleskey, who was an African-American man who was on death row based on the murder of a, a white person, was statistically the most likely category of someone to get the death penalty. Very sophisticated analysis, very strong, um, strong study that was used. The court acknowledged the validity of the whole study and said, yes, it's, there, it's likely that race played a role. But all that tells us is there's a discrepancy that seems to correlate with race. And then this is the most telling part. So back in the 80s, the court decided, basically, what, what, we, can't, we cannot rule in favor of McCluskey here, because where would it end? If we allow for statistical evidence of racial bias in the death penalty, well, then what about police stops? Right? What about prosecutions? What about the rest of it? We could soon be faced with similar claims as to every other type of penalty. And that was what the four dissenters, in Justice Brennan's words, called <laughs> that the court, the dissenter said, the court's opinion seems to suggest a fear of too much justice. Okay? So these are these two terrible decisions from the 80s, just gut wrenching. Uh, I'm a lesbian ACLU attorney doing death penalty work. I hated both of these decisions. They happened to also be the two decisions that Justice Lewis Powell later said he got wrong. Okay? So think about it. As close as it could be, 5-4, and then one of the five later says, well, he should have gone the other way. Really close cases. So then the question is, given the closeness and, the, in my mind, the, in the terribleness of this, how long will we have to wait to repudiate both of those cases? So, we, time marches on, and in fact, we waited 17 years for the court to repudiate Bowers v. Hardwick. And in a wonderful victory for gays and lesbians in 2003, the court recognized the dignity and the privacy and the constitutional rights of gays and lesbians. And absolutely, they didn't just overrule Bowers v. Hardwick, that horrible judicial hate speech from the 80s, they repudiated it. They went out of their way to say, it was wrong then and it's wrong today. Okay, huge victory, huge victory. So my question is, how long will we wait for the repudiation of McCluskey? How long will we wait? And my fear is that with the current court, it will be a very, very long time. So I was really interested in something that was said recently, an uh, interview that one of my favorite justices, Justice uh, Ginsburg, said to an interviewer. She said, America has a real racial problem. And then she called out her own court, which you know she loves, right? She loves the Supreme Court. And she said, the court also has a real racial problem. What she said is, our Supreme Court was once a leader in the world combating racial discrimination. Quote, what's amazing is how things have changed. And then Justice Ginsburg drew the comparison. It's the same comparison that I made in a, a little piece in 2003 after Lawrence. And that is the court is doing astonishingly well on gay rights and going nowhere on racial justice. So Justice Ginsburg said once we, that is we in power, right? Once, once we've began to realize that gay people are our neighbors or our children, we found people we admired. But that hasn't happened with race. We still live in different worlds as to race. She says, by contrast, we don't have that familiarity. It does not exist for race. And that's Justice Ginsburg. So for those of us who care about gay rights, gay and lesbian rights, and also about racial justice, we look at a court that's doing extraordinary things for gays and lesbians. Just a year ago, in one week, and one, on Monday, the court struck down the Voting Rights Act. And then on Tuesday, they struck down the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. Extraordinary victory for gays and lesbians. Terrible day in terms of racial justice. So what I think about, what I'm haunted by, is how close we came and how we still need to get back to McCleskey. Think of how different our world would be if constitutional protection was recognized to say that we're going to take seriously statistical evidence of racial bias in the criminal justice system. So I'm haunted by the fact that, as the dissenter said in McCleskey, we seem to be controlled by a court 
that is uh, limited by a fear of too much justice. Thank you very much. Good evening, I want to thank the Honors College for inviting me, uh, Dean Jackson Elmore and John Beck for putting this together. Uh, uh, sure. I'm an anthropologist and so um, we're accustomed to uh, you know, traveling to, to uh, places that are with you know, people who are practicing unfamiliar kinds of cultures, speaking languages that are unfamiliar to us and so this represents uh, my foray into international law. Uh, where lawyers are speaking bizarre languages that are not in, very easy to understand. And I'm foolish enough to venture into this sort of a presentation while sitting next to the dean of the law college. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, I want to focus internationally. I want to focus on a specific category of rights, indigenous rights. And I want to do that through the lens of the field site where I do my, my research in southern Belize with Mopan and Kekchi Maya. A little bit of context. Um, international indigenous rights activism really emerged in the 1970s and early 80s um, and focused a lot on the United Nations um, in its efforts to claim indigenous rights. Um, in 1982, the United Nations created a working group um, on indigenous populations. In 1985, that working group began drafting a UN declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, the movement at that time was really led um, by uh, indigenous activists from the U.S. and Canada who focused a great deal on questions of sovereignty and self-determination for indigenous peoples. Uh, states, member states of the United Nations, opposed uh, notions of indigenous sovereignty. Um, and so there was an impasse, uh, negotiations went on for decades uh, without very much progress. So in the 1990s, some indigenous rights activists turned to the concept of human rights and to human rights instruments that had been developed within the UN system. And they began to have some real legal successes, uh, and so they continued down that path. Um, now human rights are generally conceptualized as uh, the property of individuals. Right? But the indigenous activists were concerned to try to get recognition for collective rights, for indigenous peoples as, as collectives. Um, they drew on the uh, existing rights treaties within the UN framework. And what was, what's interesting, particularly for an anthropologist, is they drew especially on guarantees of the right to culture. Um, in 2007, the UN General Assembly finally received and voted on the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it passed overwhelmingly. Um, but part of the story I'm going to tell here happens before that time period. Um, in addition, since the Declaration is just a declaration, it doesn't have the force of a treaty or a convention. Uh, there's no implementing mechanism. There's no body that's monitoring it. Um, and so indigenous activists continue to use existing rights treaties and conventions um, in their efforts to secure recognition of indigenous rights. I want to look at just a couple of the uh, key pieces that they've drawn on extensively in this process. One of them is the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, uh, whose Article 27 um, states that persons belonging to minorities shall not be denied the right in community with other members of their group to enjoy their own culture. There's a right to culture. Note that that right belongs to persons, not groups. Uh, the Human Rights Committee that oversees uh, the implementation of this convention uh, in 1994 uh, issued the statement that uh, regarding indigenous uh, peoples in particular, that culture manifests itself in many forms including a particular way of life associated with the use of land resources, especially in the case of indigenous peoples. Another uh, convention that indigenous rights activists have used is the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial and Ethnic Discrimination. 
Uh, the implementing body for this convention issued a, a, a recommendation in 1997 that argued that the principle of non-discrimination requires the protection of culture and cultural difference. Uh, and it argued that states should recognize and respect indigenous distinct culture, history, language, and way of life, and recognize and protect the rights of indigenous peoples to own, develop, control, and use their communal lands, territories, and resources. Indigenous rights have used, indigenous rights activists have used uh, this convention, but they've also been very careful because they do not want to claim only minority rights. They want to claim indigenous rights as people who face a distinct uh, kind of discrimination. They share discrimination with other minority groups, but there's something particular about the indigenous situation that calls for some additional uh, actions. So turning to uh, my field site in Belize, uh, this is a map uh, in the bottom uh, black and white section is the location of Belize just south of Mexico, just to the east of Guatemala. Uh, and the map, uh, the larger map, is a, a map of southern Belize. And the parts that are not white, the parts that are colored, uh, are a mapping of Maya land use. Uh, the green areas are where they hunt, uh, the, the gray areas, light green areas are uh, farmlands, the villages are in there, uh, areas where they collect resources to, uh, to build houses. Um, these lands that are colored in on this map represent lands that the Maya of Southern Belize have claimed as their own traditional territory. Um, However, the state of Belize also claims ownership of these lands um, and allows the Maya to use them. Um, and as kind of a, an indication of its assertions of ownership, in the mid-1990s, it let concessions for logging uh, on most of these lands, along with concessions for oil exploration. And that was what really brought to a head uh, these conflicting claims between the Maya uh, and the, the state of Belize. Uh, so the Maya filed a petition with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights um, that drew upon, um, on the one hand, the right to property from the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man uh, that conceptualized property as individual, um, plus the right to culture that focused on the requirement of, for indigenous peoples that they have access to their traditional territories in order to preserve their culture. They put these together to argue that the Maya have collective rights to the lands they traditionally use and that these rights should be recognized. The Inter-American Commission um, issued a decision in favor of the Maya, arguing that they did have rights to property. Uh, and what I think is the key uh, phrase from the, that very lengthy decision is this one. Uh, the property rights of indigenous peoples are not defined exclusively by entitlements within a state's formal legal regime, but also include the indigenous communal property that arises from and is grounded in indigenous customs and tradition. Okay, so what the argument is here is it, the, the state does not recognize or have any kind of regime that recognizes uh, communal land rights or ownership for the Maya but their rights to own that land come not from state law, but rather from their practice of their traditional cultural uh, forms of, of land use. Uh, so coming back to the evolving nature of rights in terms of the, of the title of this panel, um, I want to just briefly uh, talk about the results of the commission's decision. It was very exciting uh, when it came down. Uh, there was some optimism that things would change on the ground for Maya. Uh, but in fact, there's been no implementation of the decision. So and my anthropology colleagues want to know, well, what's happened in Belize? And the answer is, not much. But the decision has circulated across the hemisphere and has been cited in subsequent cases that have been taken to the Inter-American Commission or the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, to strengthen the arguments in favor of uh, recognizing indigenous rights on the basis of traditional practices. Uh, so although no treaty or convention on indigenous rights has yet been developed, we've just got that declaration, 
there has developed an inter-American jurisprudence on indigenous rights um, that is increasingly strong. Uh, the last uh, idea that I want to end with here is the question of whether uh, this case points to uh, a source of rights that's different from the ones that Steve mentioned. Uh, Steve mentioned civil rights and natural rights. One of them is inherent to humans and the other comes from a, a state legal system. Um, here's an argument, perhaps, uh, that the source of indigenous property rights is neither, but rather emerges out of their own cultural practices. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, it's fascinating listening to everyone. <laughs> well, I'm the water person, and I hope I can convince you that we take our water for granted, um, and we need to think about that a little bit more. So I'm going to talk first about the human rights and then uh, what's going on globally, and then maybe in with some thoughts. And I've got some questions to throw out to you for you all to think about. So, um, as others have mentioned, um, the United Nations have, did come together, particularly after the World War, to talk about the de declarations for human rights um, and inequality. They really divided this into civil and political rights and the economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, but I'd like to tell you that it didn't include water at that time explicitly. You might think and ask yourself why. And it wasn't really until 2010, with much debate, uh, that there was a resolution that affirmed the right to water and sanitation. And, and you can see that I said right. And now they're debating whether to add that S to it. Is, is it rights or right? Um, because these are di very different sectors, although we know they're connected. And you all know that water moves in a cycle. Um, through this declaration, of course, though, they set up um, Millennium Development Goals. You've probably heard of some of these MDGs. And there was one on water and, and sanitation. And it was to have uh, the number of people that did not have access uh, to, both, uh, to both drinking water and to sanitation. Um, and so that began, and we're nearing the end of that, 2015, so let's think about how we're doing. I think India, I just came back from India, and I thought it was quite interesting because it illustrates some of the challenges. Let's see if that goes now. Open defecation, um, standpipes, flooding, animals, open water used for drinking. Um, a recent study even came out while I was there that was highlighted in the New York Times, and you can see where India is way out there, an outlier that um, uh, malnutrition was linked to not having sanitation. And this was uh, despite having access to food. So access to food and food security was OK, but they were still malnourished. And you can imagine, I mean, if you've ever been sick and sick for very long, you really don't uh, feel like eating. And if, even if you do eat, maybe you're not absorbing what you need to. And so they've looked at this um, and related this just to the number of people uh, defecating that have no access to sanitation at all. So we're not going to meet the, sanit uh, meet the MDGs, the sanitation goals. Um, we are meeting the drinking water goals. And there's been a big debate, because the, um, in the resolution, it was about access. So access to water, as you can see here, means um, a new well. If we dig a new well somewhere, they've got access. But the, what they realized as they started uh, testing and evaluating is that access did not mean safe. So as you can imagine, water is life, safety is health, sanitation is dignity, and these things are all connected. So now we're starting to talk about the water security of billions of people as uh, population grows, as infrastructure uh, diminishes, as we're in an economic crisis, unrest, political unrest, climate change. So two new things have been talked about, this political unrest and disasters, um, obviously, with flooding, earthquakes, things like what happened in Haiti. 
There are a number of estimates. I mean, we um, uh, don't think about it uh, in the United States um, as much, but there are globally, there are still about 2 million deaths just due to simple diarrhea, due to unsafe drinking water. Um, this water quality, poor water quality, poor sanitation hygiene are, are associated with the fourth leading cause of death in the developing world. And of course, it affects children under five, so it affects our future. Um, there's 780 million people still without access to improved water sources and 2.5 billion without access to improved sanitation. Now, they've begun to look at the sustainable development goals. And these goals in which a country now, they've said that this is a human right, the, the governments have a responsibility for um, bringing um, access to water and sanitation. But you're not paying for water. You're paying for the service. And so how do we make that? The discussion is affordability. What's affordability? What's willingness to pay? And what does it mean in different parts of the world? When you go to some places where 40% um, of the water is in poor condition, and another place where it's 80%, and I can tell you the models say, unless we get to 24-7, 99% of the time, so these are not good enough, not even 80% is good enough, unless we get to 24-7, 99% of the time, health risks are high because it's contagious. We're talking about contagion. If I get sick because I don't have access, I spread it to my neighbors, I spread it to people at the market, and so on and so forth. Now, we are engaged um, uh, in this development, in this global development. Little tiny projects throughout um, are associated with this. This was a, a student from the School of Public Health right here. She went to a little tiny place in Nicaragua, is testing a simple system that costs less than a dollar a day to actually get water quality tests. Um, she had to take an airplane, then a couple of boats, then a donkey ride to get out there. She's able to take this equipment and go out, meet the people. She translated things into Spanish. She met with the, the clinic, uh, looked at what the government was doing, what could the local people do, what, what could, what's affordable. Of course, she found, with evidence now, that these rope pump wells that are protected um, where you can clean things, are less contaminated than these simple wells. So how can they build more of these rope pump wells in the community? The other thing she found is that she actually took samples back, a uh, method that was developed in the field, to come back to do sophisticated DNA testing that could be done in centralized labs throughout the world. Um, she found that animals were some of the cause, and we know these zoonotic pathogens like O157 and these things are, are highly dangerous. So they, the locals could keep their cattle, we found evidence of cattle waste in these wells, could start to keep their cattle away from the well, do something about stormwater, protect the wells from those stormwaters. These are simple things they could do to improve their health. These are the kinds of diseases they have, and respiratory disease is also caused by polluted water, um, these parasites, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, as a result of this, there was evidence base for the uh, small community coming all the way up to the countrywide of things that people could do. Um, we're focusing on a framework that the World Health Organization and others are going to try to implement around these rights and around the new sustainable development goals, around risk analysis, a science-based approach, new um, uh, methods, and emerging pathogens. We've got a, a lot of uh, new pathogens we've uh, uncovered now that are jumping from animals to humans. Um, and information technology. So it's amazing what uh, um, you can do with cell phones and other um, uh, approaches that are widespread in parts of the world that can help with access to water um, and um, access to safe water. So this is um, some of the goal. These are the interfaces where we're working at the global level. 
And I'd just like to say for you to think about um, your access here, your willingness to pay. Um, you probably heard in the news Toledo's water was just shut down. You could not swim in it, bathe in it, drink in it, drink it, or cook with it. You could not even, you could not boil it, you could not bathe in it. The toxin that was found in the water shut the water down completely. You might have heard about Bay City. Its water reservoir was disappearing and they didn't know where. They finally found the leak. They were running out of water. They were simply running out of water. And they finally found the leak, and what big leak, obviously, that was in a storm drain, dumping back into the lake. You've probably heard about the sewage backups in the basements after the flood in Detroit. And uh, the governor recently going down to talk about what kind of investment do we need at the government level to improve our water. And you've probably heard of fracking and on and on. So let's think about our right to water, our willingness to pay, um, that progressive realization, um, and uh, uh, water for life, quality for health, and sanitation for dignity. Thank you. The good news is that I don't believe in death by PowerPoint. There's only two slides. That's the first one. Please read it. Okay. <laughs> to do that. This is the slide. Um, I, I actually like my position. I've been sitting here jotting some notes down. I have a couple of things there. But I'm going to start. I could spend hours talking about the evolution of rights and medicine and whatever. And uh, we've been through a thing here for the last year where we've been debating the issue, and the question that we've been debating in the political parties is, is universal health care a right, human right? This seems to be a new concept in the 19, in the 2014s, and it really wasn't. Article 25 of the UN uh, Declaration in 1948, some of us in this room were born in the 40s, I know that, to do that. <laughs> It says, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, necessary, for, uh, necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, and other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond their control. And likewise, Article 12 of the UN International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights the states party to this agreement recognize the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. These are not new issues, but we seem to have taken it in the political issue of the government and the current thing in this debate that somehow this is open for some kind of discussion. And it is an interesting issue because politically, we want everybody to have health care as long as it doesn't affect mine. That's really the argument, and we use the scare tactics of, oh my gosh. And I could spend two hours talking about that or more and have done it on occasions, but today I decided to talk about, since this is a scientific community and I deal with medical research issues and to, to talk about essentially evolving nature of rights concerning medical research, which we take for granted here to do this. The Nuremberg trial in 46 marked the beginning of what we talked about as our modern discussion of, um, of the rights and ethics of medical research. And we tend to block this out, but we learned a lot during World War II with the Germans. And we had physicians that were well-trained and took the same Hippocratic oath everybody else did, but then were bastardized by the government and the issues to do this. And they did experiments on the Jewish prisoners because, quote, they were less than human. We tend to makes it easier for us to define this issue, to do this. We learned how much cold the human body could stand during World War II. That article, those are published data. We put people in ice baths until they died, and we tracked it. It was a scientific research. We would learned how much pain you can stand without anesthesia, because we operated on people during the Second World War without anesthesia. And we took track of those records. You don't see them in the medical literature, but they exist today in the archives of what was there to do this. We thought we were above all that in the United States, and then Henry Beecher's expose in 1966 
because we were looking at, we heard about the scandal in Tuskegee where we took a group of people and we treated them for syphilis. We all had syphilis, but we treated half of them and we didn't treat half of them. And we watched them for 30 years. The people that had been treated and the people that didn't, and we never told them they weren't being treated. And we learned a lot about the trip syphilis, moving to second, third, and every medical student today that I train learns about tertiary syphilis. And those studies were all done on the basis of somebody decided it made scientific proof or evidence to not treat these people and not tell them they weren't being treated. Beecher then blew the roof out of it because it wasn't just a poor black population. We in 1966 learned that in hospitals in our big centers like Harvard, Stanford, um, Mayo Clinic and whatever, we're injecting people with live cancer cells to see if their immune system would pick them up and we never told them they were doing it. And thus, we have the creation of the institutional, the IRBs of the universities and whatever that said, wait a minute, we're, this is wrong. The federal government said, this is absolutely wrong. If we're going to do medical research on somebody, we needed to tell them what we were doing. Although, as a physician, I can say, gosh, I can learn a lot. I, I need to know the answer to this. Does your immune system protect you if I inject your mother's cancer cells into you? That's an interesting question. But who wants to volunteer for that, to do that, All right, to do that? The ethical tensions that have gone between medical research and the obligations of the physician-patient relationship and those of the researcher-subject relationship are very, very interesting. And in my career in medicine, I've noticed an interesting thing. We have four generations now that are currently, oh, actually five, but four right now. The baby boomers and the traditional people before 1946, when they came to me as a doctor and I knew they had lung cancer, I'm a pulmonary disease specialist, and I would say, Myrtle, you've got lung cancer. Those population would say to me, what do I need to do, doc? They didn't want to debate about what are my options and whatever. They wanted me to tell them. It was a benign or a benevolent paternalism that it was in the doctor-patient relationship. And that has changed and is changing to do this. When you get to the Gen Xers, it's like whatever, however, they will bring me <laughs> 10 articles that will say what's the current treatment for their lung cancer or whatever to do this. And then the, gen the millennial generation, they don't want to hear what we're going to do. They will tell me what they're going to do because they've seen that. And it's an interesting experience on the rights of people to be involved in their own health care. It doesn't matter that they don't know as much as I do about a specific issue, but they know what's important for them and their decision making on what's there to do this, to do this. In medical research, we have, we've had for years, when we want to do a study, there's a concept of clinical expose, which is up there, which is supposed to make medical research right. And if I have two ways to treat your blood pressure, and they're both equivalent, and I prefer one, and Cynthia prefers another, okay, on this issue, you can do a research study on that because they both are valid medical treatments and the outcome we can learn from something else. But how do you treat somebody that has a melanoma, a very nasty cancer, that you put them on a drug that shows great promise in treatment of that against the placebo? There's no justification for that because that dismal outcome of that cancer to do that, and that really is one of those things in clinical research. And we all do what we call, is known as therapeutic misconception. Unfortunately, hospitals and universities do this all the time. We have a clinical trial, and we have a child that has end-stage leukemia, and we've run out of all the drugs we're ever gonna use, and we say from the Mayo Clinic to Henry Ford to Michigan State, we say, we've got a, we have a phase one clinical trial that we think might be able to help you. Let me dissuade you from that motion because most doctors and people don't understand this. A phase one clinical trial is not to help you medically. Let me repeat that. It is not to help you medically. It is to a toxicity trial to see how much of this drug I can give you before it kills you. Now, it will help people beyond you, but the chances of you being cured by a phase one critical trial approach zero. But we all play this game. 
the doctors don't like to think about it, and the patients want to believe there's hope to do this. And so we go through this game to do this, and it's one of those issues that you need to think about when we're doing these clinical trials. A physician is ideally supposed to take the patient's best interest of them only in charge and not think about the population. I'll give you a good example of this, 1962 dialysis. In 1962, we could dialyze a certain amount of people, but we didn't have enough to do it. And the public found out that every hospital in this country had a dialysis panel, which meant if you were 55 years old and diabetic, you did not get dialysis. And that outcry came and the federal government stepped in and they said, we're going to make it mandatory. Everybody gets dialyzed. We are now dialyzing 96-year-old people right now in Lansing to do this. And it's paid for by the federal government. That's why all these dialysis centers spread out. But the evolving nature of rights is if we answer every program that has on a patient, individual patient versus a population and throw money at it, your tax bill will be 100% of what you make within 10 years. We can't do that anymore. The patient versus population dilemma continues to play out. It will be the evolving nature of human rights, the social pressures, and the change that we need to make from the benevolent paternalism that we used to do all this time to making it a clinical decision that we need to do. Interesting times we live in. Thank you. So I'll take a stab at this mic. I don't think it, can you hear me very well with this mic? All right, I'm gonna share what I, what I thought I heard across the panelists um, just to kind of stoke the fire a little bit. Um, some consistent themes and I'm actually gonna start with the all men are created equal. To my fellow political scientists, some of us when we teach this say, what was meant when that was written is all white male landowners are created equal. And you might even stretch to say all straight white male landowners <laughs> were created equal. So what does that really mean when we talk about the Constitution and rights? Um, also, the role of government in rights, whether it's natural rights or inherent rights, what ran through all of this is that somehow as a society, we've decided that government has a role to play in establishing rights, and, and how far does that go? So there were lots of underlying legal issues that we need to sort through. The inconsistencies in approaches to injustice, social injustice or otherwise, so it's not like we've decided as a society that there are are a range of options that are acceptable for approaches to injustice. We're just kind of scattershot. We, we throw out and see what sticks, and until someone screams, we, we just keep going. And, and how do we move forward if that's really the approach? And what allows us to bridge the gap? We see all of these inconsistencies. We see that new and different types of populations are clamoring for rights, and, and what do we do to ensure that at least we do more than lip service to address them? How do we deal with collectivities versus individuals? You know, everyone's going to say, treat me as though I'm a person, and yet at the same time, everyone sits within a group, and any group that's disenfranchised has to think about how they, as an individual versus the group, needs to be dealt with. And how do we enforce rights? You know, the issue of doctrines versus treaties or constitutions, but even beyond that, we all know the most simple policies on paper in practice never play out the way they were intended. So how do we enforce rights once they're established? A um, Couple more things I'm gonna throw at you is in terms of the conflict over land ownership and use. Whether you say indigenous populations or not, even down to in the US, if you say 40 acres and a mule, you know, who owns the land and what are we going to do with it and who has a right to it? And we had another panel on water, and the whole idea is how far out into the seas do rights extend and what do we do about that? How do we preserve culture? It's not just about indigenous populations. When people migrate and immigrate, what does that mean in terms of how culture is protected and how much do we tell people to assimilate in order to get their rights taken care of? And one of the things that didn't come up, but as we were talking about water rights, and one of the things that came to mind is environmental issues in general and the whole NIMBY. 
you know, not at all in my backyard. Yes, we need to move forward with development. Yes, we need technology. Yes, we need industry. Yes, we need whatever it is, but don't put it right here. Put it somewhere else. And that's the flip side of, okay, I'm trying to develop. I'm trying to make sure I have potable water. I'm trying to make sure I have good sanitation, and, and how do I address it? And so we always have these tensions between the in-group and the out-group, and they change, and what do we do about that? And this whole idea about the collective sets of rights that we have. Um, another thing underlying social justice is how do you deal with distribution and how do you deal with recognition? And some of that was at play here. The identities that are on the table and who gets what resources and, and who gets to do what. And the less than human. It's a theme through everything, if you think about it. You know, who really do we say is human, and what rights do they have, and how do we define humanity, and the different ways that we say you and I are equal to each other. And finally, what is the rights of people, not only to be involved in their own health care, but in any major decision that affects their life and their quality of life. What is the rights of individuals and collectivities? And so as I was listening across the panel, you may have said they, they were all talking about different themes, but those were some of the things that really cut across what everyone had to say. And so before we throw it to the floor, I want to see if the panelists have anything that they want to say on any of those points or to things that you heard from each other and kind of give you a chance to reflect on each other. And sometimes the panelists say no, just throw it to the floor immediately. So if that happens, that's fine. But I do want to give them an opportunity. Well, I've got one for Steve, since you brought up the rights and the Lincoln debates. And, uh, <laughs> I'm a child of the 60s, clearly, and I spent four days in a Macon County, Georgia jail during the um, bus rides and whatever, back a time in my life when we were doing this. But I'm interested, we've, we've, what they did with Lincoln doing this, and I flash back, in the last couple of months, we've had Trayvon Martin shot for no real reason, and you had Michael Brown shot in uh, St. Louis, and these issues don't seem to make sense to me on the issue that neither one of these people I, I think their rights were really violated on this, and we're 100 years away from this. We're 50, 60 years away from the Civil Rights Movement, and we still haven't made much progress in this kind of issue, To the way I'm looking at it, to do that. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the lesson of uh, Lincoln's statesmanship, I think, to recur to my uh, comfort zone, uh, uh, is that <coughs> we must be careful to distinguish between those categories of rights which belong to human beings simply as human beings and which don't amount to much. Well, they amount to, 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 to a lot when the nation accepts the wicked practice of slavery. But past, once, this, once slavery is abolished, the arguments from natural rights that enabled Lincoln to contest slavery don't help us very much in achieving the much more difficult, um, in, in, in winning the much more difficult battles about social and political equality. So then the question is, and this is, this takes us, um, then the question is, well, what are the forms of argument? What are the forms of moral argument that enable us to deliberate together about social and political equality, about the meaning of civil rights, constitutional rights, past the bare minimum that is natural rights? Um, and one of the difficulties is that if we're too much in the thrall of natural rights thinking, we won't be very good at that kind of deliberation. And it seems to me that that has been our fate since something like the generation after, uh, af after Lincoln, that we have had a tendency to treat rights questions not as subjects of democratic deliberation, but as subjects of natural and then constitutional uh, principle. Um, those are, I mean, <laughs> These are useful categories, but it means that we haven't been as good as we might be 
as, as democratic deliberators about the meaning of shared citizenship, what it means to make a life together uh, as, uh, as Republican citizens. By the way, I do think this, this um, I, would, I, I would say that this, this same line of argument um, ha has long given me some pause about the progress that the gay community has made in the courts. Um, I hope that that progress is sustainable, and I guess I think it is. Um, a generation ago, or you know, 15 years ago, I might have had doubts, but it seems to me that that was always the danger, and it's the danger of the, especially of the gay marriage debate, not of the sodomy debate, that to turn it into a question for courts and to make it a question of, of you know, rights, which, rights with a capital R right, rather than of de democratic deliberation can be a dangerous thing. And I think that's, that plays out in the kinds of cases you've mentioned. Anma, is there any other reflection from the panelists? Well, I, I was going to um, ask about the water rights linked to land use and land rights because they, they often are linked. Um, uh, and even though you do have modifiers that say you cannot harm downstream users or first time users, and how is that played out in your scenario? Um, um, there actually is a, a in Belize, a powerful environmentalist movement that is uh, in opposition to the oil exploration, particularly in protected areas and in the barrier reef. Belize has this, the longest barrier reef in this hemisphere, the second longest in the, in the world. Um, and interestingly, they've made an alliance with um, Maya organizations uh, to try to counter oil exploration in protected areas and in the offshore. Um, the Maya are arguing you have no right to do this because these lands have been recognized as ours and you have not, you, you do not have our permission, you did not consult us before doing this. Uh, whereas the environmentalists are arguing we have too much to lose um, when our environment is contaminated by an oil spill. So there's an interesting alliance there where they're really talking past each other and they have not embraced one another's causes or recognized the, their significance. So we want to make sure that you have a chance to get your questions answered. So John has a mic, and he'll come and find you. That would be raising your hand so that I can find you just like he did. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is for the other, and it's in over two parts. Uh, first is quite specific. What was the vote in the Second part is how are we as citizens, as laymen, to think about a 5 4 vote? I guess any 5 4 vote doesn't have um, implications that we need to be made aware of generally, almost irrespective of the particular issue. Sure, thank you. First of all, about Lawrence v. Texas, I probably need some other lawyers to help me here. I think it was 6-3. Um, we, we have certain members of the court who continue to be staunchly uh, unimpressed with, for example, the kind of an analysis that I gave. Um, so 6-3, so I think it was right. Uh, Justice Scalia, well, anyway, there are justices who are not impressed with the idea that there are constitutional rights related to gay people. Um, the, the issue about divided cases is really an interesting one, the, I think, and difficult. Because in, it's always about the moment in time in, in, in history, right, when a case is decided. You don't really know what the impact is going to be um, until you give it some time. We know at a certain level, though, that a court is strongest when it can be unanimous. So for example, um, Brown versus Board of Education, the Chief Justice worked very hard. And in some ways, some of the problems with that opinion, the lack of depth, if you will, of that opinion came from the compromise process of making it a unanimous opinion. 
Um, the, I just heard the Michigan Supreme Court Chief Justice last week, a couple days ago, talk about his pride in the recent history in the Michigan Supreme Court of a higher percentage of unanimous cases. And that's obviously because <laughs> if it's 5-4, well then anybody can see that it really could almost have gone the other way. And that means it's more vulnerable to being, um, being overruled at some point or, or, or being whittled down, whittled, whittled, whittled down in some way. So part of what's interesting to me, I think, about the Bowers and McCleskey contrast is that there's been absolutely no whittling down of McCleskey at all. It stands as tall and as strong as if it had been a unanimous, as if it were um, completely uncontested, of course, that, that it would just be going too far to look at statistical evidence. We would never do that, uh, in spite of the fact that, that, of course, it really was as close as it could possibly have been. That, that really has not been the predominant line of argument, in part because um, there's been an effort to, for, for instance, the state of Belize does not recognize Mopan and Kekchi Maya as indigenous. They claim that they migrated from Guatemala um, you know, in the <laughs> 1880s, so they really don't have any indigenous rights in Belize. Um, the the Inter-American Commission so. found otherwise. Um, but there have been cases that followed up on this, for instance, a uh, case of uh, maroon community in Suriname. Uh, so you have African descended people who escaped from slavery, formed maroon communities in the interior uh, who are petitioning for land rights. Um, and the, there's an international labor organization convention on indigenous and tribal peoples. And so when they petition, petitioned uh, to the Inter-American Commission, you know, it was actually a bureaucratic and budgetary issue. Like, so who's, who, who's in charge of them? Indigenous or tribal? And they said, they, they convened and they talked about it and they said, we want to be tribal. Um, and so their case extended this to Afro-descendant populations, people who don't have to claim indigenous identity, but who nonetheless are claiming rights to land because of their traditional cultural practices and using it and living there and the kinds of relationships that involves with the land itself and the way that it's even conceptualized. <laughs> As we know, millions of people have moved to the desert areas of California where they don't have much water. So if they have a right to water, then they have a right to Michigan's water. And then since Michigan's water originally belonged to the Odawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe, um, do we, of European Americans, have a right to send their water to California? And then when do indigenous rights begin? Like the Palestinians, were they there before the Israelis? Yeah, so, um, so water ownership, there's the water rights at the, at the uh, national uh, level um, is governed by, uh, for example, in the United States, um, land use, um, the Eastern uh, doctrine or the Western doctrine. So in the Eastern parts of the United States, we have a different law governing our water rights of, of who owns the water. Uh, than compared to the Western United States. So in the Western United States, for example, the northern part of California or even uh, Colorado and Nebraska and all those where the water originates from has to keep the water flowing uh, through a treaty. And these are treaties and compacts. And we have a compact with, with Canada. 
But there is uh, private ownership, so there is state ownership, and there is, um, and so the treaty within the Great Lakes um, says that the water should be protected for the economic vitality of the nation, and, and that there is a uh, rule in there that says that it, it, so it cannot be withdrawn. And so you would have to try to reverse that treaty. Now other countries, the, whole, the, the government owns the water. So the government decides, yes, and whether you have access and that whole thing. But, it, but in the United States, it's very, it is tied to land, it is tied to our, our boundaries, our political boundaries. Um, early in the history of water, probably in the world, and, and even in the United States, you know, people didn't think that it was ever going to be a, a stressed resource. You know, they talk about it as a recycling, it's, you know, it's the renewable resource, you don't have to worry about it. And um, the early maps, uh, as they started building waterworks, these fabulous waterworks in New York and every place, actually have waterworks connecting the whole United States through the Great Lakes, the old maps, all the way to the south. And there is talk about having a national water policy in which there could be more, um, instead of fights, so uh, many states have had fights that have gone to the courts. The southern states have fought around water and water resources, and they go to the courts. And so many have said we need a national water policy to talk about uh, sharing, sharing our resources in a, in a better way. Technology could solve it. It's, it's a matter of cost. Um, desalination uh, is one, and wastewater reclamation, where they're reclaiming all the water out of wastewater to a very high purity level and it goes back into the drinking water supply. So that's what's happening in California. Orange County is resilient because it has a big recycling system. Other parts of the South are not very resilient to these um, droughts. So I think you had mentioned, I thought it was a really nice synopsis, but um, how scattered things are and fragmented and um, even implementing the United Nations policies um, there's no standard approach, and, and, and on the sanitation side in particular, it's just out of sight, out of mind. They've done nothing about it, even though it's in there. Whereas on the drinking water side, they've done a little bit better. So it's just really fragmented, and it's even fragmented in the United States. Yeah, yeah. I hope I got some of your questions answered. John, there was a second part to the question tied to indigenous. Um, part of the contention uh, involved in the negotiation of in this indigenous rights declaration in the UN context has been over the definition of who is indigenous. And uh, the indigenous delegates to the working group have always said that there was no requirement for a definition. Uh, there's no requirement for what constitutes a proper state to belong to the UN, they said, so why should we have to confine ourselves to a, a definition? And so they have inserted language that um, involves self-definitions. And, um, and it's pretty much, it's, it's, it's worked that way. It's, it, this makes states very uncomfortable. But it's also been part of the, um, the opportunity then for the spread of claims to indigeneity and indigenous rights outside of the Americas or uh, Australia, New Zealand, where the colonial context was very clear, um, to Asia and Africa. Uh, so there, there are now indigenous rights uh, cases being brought to the African uh, human rights tribunals. Um, and it's, it's, it's not so much based on we were here first and then these other people came, as we have been marginalized in a way that is recognizable across everybody who participates in the UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations. Uh, and so people, you know, it, was, it was an emerging kind of identity where people heard others' complaints, um, analyzed their positions, and recognized similarities in terms of the ways that they had been marginalized and the reasons they had been marginalized. We are marginalized because we are culturally distinctive. Um, and, and so the category of indigeneity itself has expanded enormously and been extreme, it continues to be extremely contested by states who say we, have, you know, we are all indigenous here or you know, we have no indigenous people. Um, and it's, to, to some degree it's actually kind of complicated things for uh, people in the Americas uh, because the idea of indigeneity has become kind of diffuse.
<laughs> well, I know with the, um, with the industry is coming to for water um, is that um, the service, trying to get at a service that's affordable. And um, they're suggesting that the poor or whoever cannot afford to pay, it's not about a, you know ability to pay, willingness to pay, but can't, can't pay, that they need to, um, that the governments need to set up a subsidy and, and that everybody should have the same service rather than a special service for the poor because what that has turned out to be is a poor service for the poor. So um, I guess in this case with um, increasing um, economies and it, it is linked to increasing um, water, but with subsidies for those who can't afford to pay. And the greatest example of that's going on in Detroit with the water bills and whatever. Oh, yeah. This is absolutely yeah. right there to yeah. do this. And that's been going on in wow, you know, you look at that. They can't just turn um, off the water. <laughs> so does might might make right? Well, the United States we hope it does. Okay, to do that. So Well, that's almost the case. <laughs> um, let, me, I, let me take the first run at it for the medical side since you brought it up. Um, two things. I mean, I was I'm a pulmonary disease intensive care doc by training. I've done a lot of this stuff. Jehovah's Witness, uh, you have an absolute right to your religious beliefs, and that should be a, a, taken into account to your health care. And if you believe, you should not use this saying, I agree with that. But when you have a six-year-old child, your child, that basically has a curable leukemia but needs a blood transfusion to do this, it becomes a debatable issue because the six-year-old has not reached the point of making that decision. You're making the decision for the six-year-old and that will a live or die decision. What you do personally to make that decision I agree with, the six-year-old I have a problem with if I know that we can do something to help that issue out. Now, you're going to get in the huge debate about that's my religious right. Well, it's not your religious, it's not your religious right to beat that child to death. I don't care in what culture you are, for the most part. And so I've been involved in that case where actually the court gave me custody of the six-year-old for the month they were in the hospital while we were treating. The child is still alive today. And the family basically have gotten over it, but we were in court for a long time to get me custody so we could treat that child in Denver, Colorado. So it is one of those, it's, it, there's no absolutes. You just have to look at that right to do this. On the issue of women's rights and whatever, it is very, very interesting depending, I just was in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and I was there and in the hospital I was at, 12 people died of Middle Eastern respiratory virus. The good news is I'm beyond the incubation period. My wife now lets me s <laughs> sleep in my bedroom. But bottom line is, I mean, that's how close we are in the world to every disease. We're dealing with Ebola. You're 12 hours away. And in Lansing, with a major university here, you're closer than most of the people in the world because we have people traveling to all those places just to give you something to sleep with tonight when you go out there to do that. Okay. But in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, one of the interesting things for me is I was having a big debate with an orthopedic surgeon at the hospital because he was trying to convince me that I needed four wives because it would make it better. And I've been married 48 years 
And I told him at the dinner, being polite, I said, if I had four wives, I'd never finish my honeydew list. And culturally, I have to tell you, he did not understand that joke because in their world that doesn't exist. And it was really, they don't do those kind of things, that they have people that do that. But the interesting thing about that culture, he defends the practice of the restrictive covenant there as they respect women so much. And it's an interesting discussion when you take that for that point. My wife and my daughters would be opposite to that, but it is an interesting thing of what rights they have and what they don't. My exposure was getting in an elevator in an intercontinental hotel. I never thought about it, but I got on the fourth floor, the elevator stopped, it opened, there was a woman in the elevator. I got in the elevator and she looked at me and she got out of the elevator because she cannot ride in an elevator down with me in the elevator because I guess they got Doesn't the- Doesn't have a chaperone. Doesn't have a chaperone, or they got the memo that I'm not trusted in elevators. I don't know <laughs> to do that. But it is interesting when you travel the world, you see those kind of different things and how you deal with that issue to do that, so. So with water, you have to take culture into effect. And they found this out. Um, women take care of the water, women and children in many places of the world. And when they didn't um, take the cultural aspects uh, into account the microfinancing or the plans to reach reach people didn't work. And so they, uh, they really had to learn that that had to take place. And then on the other side of the coin is that um, one of the main reasons uh, girls don't go to school in many places in the world is there's no sanitation. And the boys, fine, they don't care, go behind the bush, whatever. But the girls, and especially when they get older and they're menstruating and everything else, so this is another where there's a clash, a, a somewhat of a clash between the, the, the culture and then the inadequacy of the government to, or, or the school to provide for that set. That set. And so, um, and say, so, so it was sort of, we didn't value and we didn't care whether girls went to school and so why should we build sanitation in schools? and that kind of thing. So you could see that uh, uh, clash there. But you, so you could see it in both ways. One side of the coin where you improve things because you understand the culture, and another side of the coin where there's a real clash in um, philosophies about uh, access to education for, for young girls in particular. Did any of the other panelists want to take a stab at that question? Yeah, let me just, a uh, couple of things. I think this is an, an excellent question. It points to a real problem with um, our, our habits of discourse on the question of rights. That many claims that we, we discuss in the language of rights might better be discussed, might better be uh, subjects of negotiation, accommodation, deliberation, compromise. That when we turn when we turn a question from, uh, from a question of deliberation to a question of right, when we legalize it, when we constitutionalize it, or much worse, when we make it a question of natural rights, the difficulty is that there's no ground for accommodation between competing ways of life, competing uh, understandings. On the other hand, however, right, we need, a, we need a bottom line. We need a place to stand past which we won't uh, permit ourselves to be pushed. Um, that you know, de sort of designates what is that bedrock understanding of human or natural rights which we will fight for and which we won't abandon on, uh, in the face of, of any uh, 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 provocation. So my sense is that in our world, we've moved too far in the direction of rights with a capital R, and we have lost the habit, therefore, of, uh, of, of deliberation, accommodation, um, a, a compromise, across these kinds of, 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 of boundaries. So I think that's interesting, and I don't agree, as you knew. <laughs> because to me, the, um, I think of constitutional rights as an ongoing dialogue that is ultimately uh, political. The, Sup the Supreme Court is an um, intensely political entity. Obviously, that's why it matters who's, it's one of the reasons it matters who's elected president, 
because the, it's a political process that decides who's going to be on the court, for example. <coughs> they use the rhetoric of um, attempting to somehow submerge the political reality of their role, right? But it's sort of part of the civic culture that we have. But it's, they are a political entity in a set of political dialogues with the, other, with the elected officials, with the citizenry, which I think is why, without really thinking about it, I used a slide of the gay rights movement to sort of stand in for 17 years between Bowers and then, um, and then uh, Lawrence v. Texas, because clearly the Supreme Court is interpreting the same words in the Constitution, absolutely in light of the changing political um, world that they're in, right? They have a different sense of to whom they're accountable and a more inclusive sense of who, to whom they're accountable as, I would say, political actors interpreting the broad phrases of, say, equal protection, which is all they have to make some sense out of. So to me, it's, a, um, it's just a different kind of a dialogue, a different kind of an interaction, a different kind of a negotiation to include the, um, the constitutional rights, for example, and it's particularly the kind of dialogue that matters where the country has come far enough to protect some particular minority group, but not quite far enough that that group is going to be protected everywhere, which is essentially what the Supreme Court's like a halfway house, right? When we're halfway there, they take us the rest of the way. <laughs> if you'll indulge me, John. I mean, I think actually we, we probably don't disagree uh, that far. Uh, it seems to me that if the court were more willing to acknowledge its role as an interlocutor in a, in a constitutional debate, and if on the other side, Congress were willing to assert its role as an interlocutor in constitutional debate, we'd be a lot better off. It would also, I think, draw the people into thinking in constitutional terms, which we don't do now. When we go to the polls, most of us don't think ab about our vote as a constitutional act. And I think if we, if we, if our, if our, if our, if the deliberate, if, if the political institutions acknowledged the kind of their their role in a, in an ongoing conversation about the meaning of these doctrines, where no side was authoritative, and every, then we, then then I think the people would would be pulled in in a healthy way. I agree. <laughs> I, I would just add to that. I think there there is an inherent tension between the uh, some kind of a right to equality and the right to difference. Equality is a lot easier if everybody's the same. If people insist on being different or value their difference, that makes it much more difficult um, to negotiate um, the way that some sort of equality might be attained. Uh, and I get, looking at it from, from an, an anthropologist's point of view, and specifically looking at issues of gender, um, which anthropologists have looked at a great deal in terms of uh, the issue of women's, women's rights as members, as women, but as members of a collective uh, that, that might submerge women's rights. Uh, and one of the things that anthropologists have tended to find is that um, there is a preference on the part of, of the women uh, in question to want to uh, fight out or negotiate um, within the group uh, with which they're claiming collective rights to cultural difference, um, as opposed to having to have the debate kind of on a national stage uh, with people who may not really value their difference. Uh, so the, the, the kind of cultural difference that people are um, fighting for may not be a homogeneous uh, vision that they all share. There may be pieces of it that they share, but there may be contention within a cultural group about what it is that they really, what agendas they're really trying to advance and what they really want to stand for and what practices they really want to engage in. Um, and so one of the questions we might need to ask is, you know, who is, who is best positioned to resolve these issues? Um, and, and what kinds of alliances enable or uh, prevent uh, certain people from making their voices uh, more easily heard. Now, we're going to let this be our last question over here, and then I'm going to turn it back to uh, uh, you 
Responding from the perspective of the Maya case in Belize, um, you're, you're absolutely right. That is why nothing has happened in terms of uh, demarcating and titling lands to the Maya on the ground. So this, the, the, the case was successful and it's had a, a very active life circulating throughout the inter-American system, but nothing has changed for the Maya on the ground because the state has uh, ignored its duty uh, as that as that duty was described in, in the Inter-American Commission's decision. Um, and in fact, the, the recent appeals court decision in Belize upheld the Maya right to land, but found that the state had no duty to implement a mechanism that could bring the Maya land ownership into reality. Um, so absent a duty, it's impossible for, for anything to happen. Yeah, with water, the same thing. Um, I, if you look at the, uh, the one slide I had, there's only so many hundreds of nations that signed on to the treaty so far on the right to water and, um, and sanitation. And um, even though in 2010 they signed on, and the government was, had the duty to implement it, they didn't do it. And, um, and it was partly the argument was the affordability because it was about the service, not really the idea that people had access to water, but it was the issue of the service. So yeah, that's, that's what they're debating right now. We solved it with our indigenous population. We gave them all the casinos to do that. <laughs> they're gonna have all the money anyway, so it won't matter to do that. So McCluskey had McCl I mean, to me, I think what I was saying, the court was saying is the duty would be too onerous for us to um, have to establish the lack of racial bias in who gets executed or 
down the road then who gets prosecuted or who gets who gets stopped by the police so you're right i mean the and, the, and we're still learning that lesson. This week alone, they had two kids on death row or two people for 30 years that were on death row fighting this out that were just proven to be absolutely innocent by the DNA stuff they did and both were released after 30 years in prison. There was no lack of notice that both these people were black in that issue to do this. You know, that's outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. And the reason the duty question doesn't get answered blatantly is that as a global society, we're very good at kicking the can down the road, right? Um, and, and that's what's at the heart of it. But your question also gets to the heart of this series. The whole reason we do this is that we cannot answer all of these thorny questions in two hours or two years, right? But yet, you have the resources still here on campus to continue these dialogues. And we hope that you continue to talk with each other that you email the panelists, that you talk with others and bring them into the conversation about, you know, how do we get to the duty? How do we agree on the duty? You know, are there inherent rights? I mean, if the conversation stops here tonight, then we failed. But based on the questions that you asked, I'm trusting that at least one or two of you will go out and have a broader conversation. And maybe three or four of you will talk with the panelists or they'll talk with each other, and then we've achieved our goal. We want to tackle these big issues that don't have solutions, and there's lots of different perspectives that you bring to them, because as Steve alluded to, if we're not able to have the conversation, then we don't move anywhere. I mean, we can give everything to government, but ultimately, we're a set of people, right? And so if we as people don't take it on, then it won't get addressed. And I like the issue about voting and the tie to the Constitution, I dare say, that there's a segment of the population that if they do not, and I'm part of that segment, recognize how tied voting is to the Constitution, re removed from how much you think of it as a constitutional duty, we're in trouble. If the next generation of African Americans don't understand that they may no longer have a right to vote, this country has not only gone backwards, we've turned everything back upside down. Right? And so this whole idea of how do we have these conversations with people in a way that it doesn't have to be comfortable, it just has to not be confrontational. And, and how do we get to the heart of things? And so I want to thank the panelists again. I want to thank you for your time. And I encourage you to ask any questions. And not same place, but same general place, November 10th. Tell your friends, spread the word. We hope to see you out.